everyone's idea of what snuggling and cuddling with a puppy is, is probably a little bit different. Welcome back, everybody. Another episode of the podcast here. Um, been traveling quite a bit. Just coming off 4th of July. I hope everybody had a good 4th of July, a safe 4th of July. I hope no one uh, lit fireworks around puppies. Um, I do think that that is a, an issue. I handled it this year. Um, Makina has been introduced to gunfire. Uh, I wouldn't say completely, but... She has she has been around it. We've we associated it, and it's gonna be part of our uh, make the machine series video series that we're doing with her. And Ben is posting a couple times a week on that. Yet on our YouTube channel, um, we introduced her using birds. Uh, I typically introduce our retrievers using dummies, uh, making retrieves, kind of whatever really they really gets them going. Whatever they're really excited about, we try to associate it with. Uh, gunfire at a distance. We've got podcasts on gunfire. We've got videos on gunfire on our YouTube channel, how to do it from an intro standpoint. So um, hope everybody had a good fourth. I had a, a really nice um, time up north. Uh, went to our cabin with our family, spent time with my my sisters uh, at their place, my parents at their place, which is a, a houses, I guess, on lakes that are nearby. So we had a really nice time. Um, Got a little training in, which was good. Looking to do a little more training this coming weekend. Mason's going to have Chief up there. Um, we're going to do some some gun dog work with him. Um, I'm trying to schedule a, a, another return visit out to see Jerry Coulter um, at Northwoods Bird Dogs with Makina. So busy, as always, in the summer. Um, doing the best I can to keep up with things and probably not doing a real good job with it, but, um, doing the best I can. Um, I'm sure everyone can relate to, uh, how things get in the summertime. And it just seems like, um, that it, it's hard to believe it's after the 4th of July already. So, um, I'm going to start out with a question here because I am playing some ketchup, a lot of ketchup. Um, and, but I'm, I'm dedicating some several blocks of hours to try to get caught up on, Instagram messages, Facebook messages, and emails. Probably not exactly in that order. Um, email and Instagram messages are, are I'm able to get to sooner, only because I don't. There's, I'm having technical stuff with my Facebook login and stuff. It's just a pain pain to get logged in. So uh, I kick it down the road a little bit further. But um, these ones come from Inst- This is a question from Instagram. Uh, a guy named Nick. Hey, Jeremy, I've been listening to your podcast religiously since November. I've watched your puppy training DVD and lots of YouTube stuff as well. I've been part of training as a kid and have had family dogs growing up, but I've never had my own dog until my wife and I are set to get our first together, a black lab on July 1st. It'll be seven weeks old. So Nick probably just got his puppy. Today is, I think, the 5th or 6th of July. It says, then it goes on to say, I guess my question to you is, it's probably a stupid one, but it's okay. Is it okay to snuggle a puppy? I laugh as I say this because it sounds so dumb, but my wife is concerned my training mindset won't allow her to snuggle the puppy. My fear is the puppy will get used to her holding and coddling it and therefore expect it as it grows older, which I don't exactly want. I've suggested holding it and snuggling it on the floor, but you know how wives can be, LOL, needless to say. But what do you suggest us to do in this situation? What is okay and not okay as far as holding the snuggling and snuggling a new pup? Thank you and I love your stuff. Well, first of all, let's address this, uh, but you know how wives can be. Yes, I do know how they can be, Nick, they're right. So you always, you gotta learn that right away. So, but in all honesty, I I joke a little bit about that, but it is important. I think it's important to have that, that consistency factor. I talk about consistency a lot in training. And so that transfers not only to you and the dog, but it can, it, it, it involves everyone around the dog that's involved with the dog. So yeah, you gotta be on the same page. And sometimes that's challenging. I know that personally. I, I experience it. 
I don't think anyone listening to this doesn't. Like that dynamic of dealing with people is sometimes even more challenging than the dog. And I don't mean it. I don't mean it in like a, a butting heads aggressive way. I mean it in like just everyone's got their own ideas. Everyone has their own things. And, and I, I do think that the dogs are pretty adaptable. But I also think that there has to be a, a level of consistency in, in X and maybe understanding of expectations for the dog's behavior. So to address your, so that's broad, to address your answer specifically, the idea of your concern with her snuggling the puppy. No, I don't, you know, I don't think I, I, I so I was thinking about this question before and I, I, it made me realize this is a very specific question talking about a very specific scenario, snuggling and cuddling with a puppy. But you know, there's nothing in training. I can't say anything in training is super, super 100% black and white. Because I also, th I, I think there's just too much room for, for variables there. Like, I, I encourage the idea of snuggling and cuddling with the puppy. So, I, uh, so if I say that, some people will take that as green light go ahead and do whatever we want to do for snuggling and cuddling with the puppy. Now, everyone's idea of what snuggling and cuddling with the puppy is, is probably a little bit different. Like my, I'm, I'm reading this book right now. Um, I've started it. It's called the other end of the leash. It's a, a really good friend of mine gave me the book, a very good dog trainer. And he gave it to me. He said, I think this, I think you'll like this. So I'm just getting, I'm kind of getting into it. In one of the chapters, they talk about, it's a, it's a lot about body language. And so it's, it's about how we communicate with our dogs and how the dogs communicate with us and how they, maybe more importantly, how they read us. So I started thinking about this book and, and there's a lot of things in that book that make a lot of sense to me. But even a book, and, and this is a, I'm not sure she, her, she's a doctor of some sort. Um, she's a real established trainer and um, that wrote the book. And even in reading it, and quite honestly, even in listening to it, because I also got it on Audible, so I listen to it sometimes in the truck. But hearing someone read it to me or reading it myself leaves a little bit of room for interpretation. And so I, there was a chapter in there, that book about hugging dogs, about how kids, children, young kids especially, have this. It, and it's a, it's, it's, the, it's a spinoff of the chapters talking about how, how humans and primates, like monkeys and orangutans and different, different monkey-type animals, communicate and express things to each other, how we hold hands, how we hug, how we kiss how we do do certain behaviors that canines don't and so it's this confu there's this confusion potential confusion there because we're speaking two different languages so in this chapter in this book it talked about um how i think it was kids under the age of i don't know toddlers so i don't know four four or five in under i suppose how they and i think it was especially girls little girls have tendencies to want to hug stuff. So they think it's cute, they think it's soft, they think it's cuddly, they want to hug it. That's how they express themselves. And I think of Lillian, my, my three-year-old daughter, and she's a hugger. And so she runs up to dogs and wants to hug them. And so I think the lady's completely right in the, in the book. That is how people communicate. What I think is interesting and maybe conflicting a little bit, and I shouldn't say conflicting because all of a sudden now it's a combat thing, and I, I don't mean it to, to say, no, you're wrong to, about this book, but I think that it leaves a little interpretation there that is gray. Um, it's not black and white because I think that Lillian goes up to some dogs and it, a lot depends on the dog and a lot depends on exactly how she does it. Like there are subtle differences in how she approaches a dog to give it a hug. And sometimes she's very soft and, and what I read body language wise is a little bit um, 
hesitant and maybe some submissiveness. And then sometimes she goes in like a bull in a china shop and she wants to, it looks like she's going to tackle the dog. And depending on the dog, depending on the dog's situation, where the dog is, the mood of the dog, the dog itself, the personality, I think all those things play into it as well as to how that hug is received. And so I think I have heard Ellie, my Ellie, who is a very nice dog, but has a tendency to growl. She'll growl when she's to, to let people know around her she's uncomfortable. So she's not vicious. She's not um, aggressive by any means. But if you come to our door, you won't have a chance of sneaking in because Ellie's going to growl at you when you come up the driveway. And she'll growl at you as you come to the door and she'll growl at people that she doesn't know especially. And even some people that she should know, she'll give a little bit of a growl to. She's clearly telling us she's not comfortable. She's, she's pretty open about it. She's pretty willing to share it. I think I have heard her. It's very soft and very subtle, but I haven't seen it, but I've been, heard where Lillian will go up and I know what Lillian's doing. She wants to go up and give her dogs a hug. And Ellie lets her know, don't do it. And Lillian doesn't read it that way and continues to hug her and Ellie just takes the hug. So, but I've also seen Lillian go up to Blue, who's Ellie's puppy. And she'll walk up to Blue and Blue lays his ears back and he turns away, doesn't want to make eye contact with her. And he leans in at times to, to Lillian to want to snuggle. Like he, he initiates the contact at times. Ellie wouldn't do that. Blue does. Two different dogs, relatively similar situations, and they respond differently. And probably Lillian addresses them differently. I'm sure she does, because I don't think you ever do the exact same thing every single time. You might try to get it as close as possible, and at times you should try to make it as close as possible, because that's where consistency matters. But I think at times... Some of that stuff is read really differently. So going back to your message here about you and your wife, your wife wants to snuggle and cuddle. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, 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 have do I, like, I like dogs that want to be by me. I prefer dogs that are warm and, and quote-unquote cuddly as opposed to dogs that are cold and independent. That's, that's, my pers that's my personal preference. I know some guys that would prefer their dogs to stay away from them and focus on the job at hand. I, that's not me. When I'm in a duck blind, I like it when the dog puts its head on my lap. Now, I also like it when it, I can say to him, I've had enough, go lay down, and they go lay down. I don't want a dog that is just annoying and rub, continually moving his muzzle and moving my hand and forcing me to pet him. And I know dogs that do that too. So, so there's a scenario where I go, I just don't think it's black and white. I think there's a lot of middle ground there. And so I think that the answer to the question, you know, can my wife snuggle and cuddle with my puppy? Yeah, for sure. Can it become so much that the dog can't stand it without it? No, you can't go that far. But does it mean that she's not allowed to give any connection to the dog physically? No, it doesn't mean that either. So I think it's all within reason. And I, I think that, you know, we have to... I know I've talked about this before, but like extremes aren't good. I, I don't think they're good. I don't think extreme anything is good. I got a farmer friend that tells me that, I don't know exactly how he says it, but he's got it, he's got it down pat because he must say it every day to somebody. But it's a lot is good and more is better or something like that. And he's talking about fertilizers and he's talking about medicine for dairy cows and he's talking about like different, totally different subjects. But his mentality is, you know, if a lot is good, more is better. I don't think that's true with dogs. I also don't think that it's very often where it's so sterile and cold turkey where you just have zero. Like if it's a scale of zero to 100, I don't like being in the single digits and I don't like being in the, the upper 90th percentile. Like, I think that's a little too extreme more often than not. Where do I want to be? Probably around halfway, probably around that 50. But at times, you can't always be in the middle because as the dog starts to, to learn stuff and, and you're training it to do things, 
you're going to have to sacrifice. Last night is a good example. I had, my buddy Brian was over with his dog Finley. He's been to some workshops, multiple workshops. He lives relatively close. I've got a good relationship with him and his dad, and who's my neighbor. And anyway, he, he's been bringing his dog over and we work with his dog. Well, we're working on running his dog on, on multiple dummies. So some, some little tightening up angles and knowing the dog off of marks and sending them for other ones, lining stuff. We're going to start working on some handling stuff with him. We're, he started on some back casting. Um, pretty soon we're going to be going right and left with the dog. But the sequence of what we're doing is... I we we're, we were talking about how how to some drills that he should work on to get the dog back casting, and one of the things that he mentioned was how he st- stops the dog, gets the dog steady, does all this very formal stuff that I would I would recommend to him doing earlier on in his training to get his dog to be steady, which it is. But now I told him, you know, I, oh, I, and actually I know what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't handling stuff. It was jumping off the dock is what he was doing. He was trying to get his dog to jump off the dock so this weekend and he, he can't get it to really launch itself off the dock. It's, it wants to run back to shore off the dock and go in, you know, go into the water off the bank. So he'd like it to jump off the pier. So I said, well, he said, you know, I, I throw the dummy out. I get the dog lined up. I line him. I, yeah, they're, they're steady. I send the dog with a lot of enthusiasm and you know vocalization, and the dog turns and runs back to the shore and gets on land and into the water and goes and makes the retrieve real nice. And I said, yeah, I said, sac-, so I, I wouldn't do it that way. I said, what I would do is I'd take the dog to the edge of the dock and get it very excited. I'd, I'd ramp it up. Um, I'd be teasing it with the dummy. I'd, I'd maybe have some tennis balls. I'd have multiple stuff there. And then I'd just pitch it a foot or two off the dock so it could barely not reach it. And then it has to push itself over the edge. I did it with Blue this weekend. Blue jumped in off the dock. And so I did it the exact same way. So I was telling him how I did it with Blue. And I just put it out there far enough that he couldn't get it. And he, he the first jump in was pretty, um, it was pretty non-athletic. I mean, he, he basically... Um, sunk into the water and got back up, got the dummy, came back to me. So we we did this two, three times, and all of a sudden he got comfortable and jumped off. And I said, so I sacrificed steadiness. I gave up something to get something. You had to build the excitement up in the drive to get the dog to jump off. Now, you don't want to do that every single time now with retrieves. You don't want to get the dog breaking. But you also realize you already built steadiness in, so you can let that go a little bit to get the dog to get over the hump of jumping off the dock. And then now you might start steadying him up a little bit. Maybe you have him stand and pitch and let him, as soon as, as soon as he gets over that mental hurdle of the dock, it won't become an issue anymore. And then you probably can go back to the way you were doing it before. And you can build up, you know, incorporate your steadiness and lining and all that stuff. And now you're off and running. But at times I'm not at that 50. If it's a zero to 100, I'm not at 50 all the time. I might have to go to 40 or 35 and get up on the other side to get to gain where I need to go on the other end. So it's this spectrum of it's constantly moving. It can't be standing still. And so with the snuggling puppy, yeah, snuggle with it. Don't snuggle with it 24-7. Don't make it be its only interaction. Don't make it be... When the dog starts fussing and, wa- and wanting to climb up on you, well, then now it, that's a little too much. So now we're going to say, no, we're going to place train you. And you're going to start learning place. And then you start to understand what place is by yourself on that little island. And then maybe in the evening, I might snuggle with you a little bit for a few minutes and get that time. And you give, let your wife have that. And then it's back to place. And then it's, it's just this constant pendulum that's swinging. So I don't think you need to be zero, but I also don't think you can be wide open on it either, Nick. So uh, let me go, jump. I'm going to jump into a second question. We're going to get two questions done in this podcast. Um, back to Instagram here. Let's see. Hey, Mr. Moore, I just wanted to reach out with a question about having two puppies together. My brother and I both have lab puppies. They're about two months apart. 
They get along great and love playing with each other. I'm curious if there are certain things that you don't allow your pups, Makina and Blue, to do together. For example, tug of war or just general roughhousing. I apologize if you've covered this before and I missed it. New to dog training world and have been slowly working through the content. Also, thank you for all that content and being genuine. I'm sure you know this, but you're a badass dude and have been one hell of an inspiration for me. Well, I appreciate that, Kevin. Uh, I really do. Um, let me, sh I think it's a great question. I've probably talked about it before. I think I've talked about mul training multiple dogs. I know Ben has put out, um, I don't know what we call, they're called Jeremy's Journal. I think they're basically like, he shares some of the, the, the written um, questions that we get that I answer and I'll copy Ben in on it and he'll share it under our journal. It's just another way of sharing information. So I, I think I did one recently about someone who was training two puppies together. But, um, and, and this is a little bit different because it sounds like it's you and your brother. It's not that you're training litter mates or two of the two puppies yourself. I am, and you know that with Makina and Blue. And so I can give you a lot of good examples um, of what I do and what I don't do. You're right. I don't do tug of war. I don't do tug of war with multiple dogs. I don't do tug of war with one dog. I think tug of war is the worst thing you can do for a retriever. One of the worst things you can do, I think. I think it creates very possessive dogs. I think it creates dogs that want to play this game. And it's absolutely the last game I want a retriever to play in. I don't want them bringing birds and pulling on them. I don't want them damaging game. I, to me, the developing a soft, gentle mouth. And I shouldn't say developing. I should say fostering it. They should have it. Um, if they don't have it, that's an issue. And, you, and so what I don't want to do is put fuel on that fire of what I think is something missing, maybe genetically. Um, Blue, for instance, has one of the nicest mouths I've, I've seen in a dog in 20 years. It's just fantastic delivery. Um, extremely natural. I can't wait to share some of the stuff we're going to be doing with him because we got a whole um, new, a new thing that we're doing with both him and his sister, Cleo. There's, you know, we're back to the litter mates. Ben's got Cleo. I've got Blue. Um, but back to your question about what do we do together? I, I am pretty careful about what, what I allow them to do together because I, I don't let them rough house. I don't let them play tug of war. I don't let them do anything that I think will create a, a, a habit or some, a behavior that I have to train out later. And so that comes back to this idea of it's way easier to avoid it in the first place than to train it out after it's become ingrained. And, and those, those habits, you know, I get young dogs want to play with each other. So what I did with them was I, 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 I established myself as the leader pretty quickly. I have to, I've got five dogs. I've got, um, we've got Spry, Ellie, Taylor in order from youngest to oldest, but they're five to nine years old. Then we had Makina and now we've got Blue and they're sep they're apart by about two or three months. And so with those two young puppies, it's all the more reason that I have to be the leader and all the more reason that I have to be able to ensure that if things start to, to go the wrong direction behavior wise, I step in. I also set them up for success by um, utilizing tools like place training. Um, I, I'll use their crates and kennels. There were times when I had them. The, the nice part was now, and you said here they're two months apart. Two months is a long ways apart. Doesn't sound like it, but when you think of a eight week old puppy versus a 16 week old puppy, they are very different dogs. Uh, I'd be more concerned with the 16 week old puppy, making sure that it doesn't create an issue with the eight week old. Now, eight week old puppy, I'm not letting play with any dogs to begin with, because the eight week old puppy doesn't really know what is and isn't acceptable and they're just too fragile and they can get hurt too quickly by making the wrong move on an older dog that is grumpy. So I keep them away from older dogs for quite a while. They may be, they may, that first month maybe. Um, you know, if, if not, if it's not possible, uh, if the dog lives with another dog, I introduce them very slowly. So I don't know how old, I don't know how old these dogs are, but if they're two months apart, they're kind of like I have with Makina and Blue. Makina is way more mature than Blue, has been. 
Um, remarkably, and I think a lot comes back to just Blue's an outstanding little dog. Um, he's real mature for his age. I, I, I'm super impressed with him. He's five, going on six, five going on maybe six months old right now. I don't think he's quite that old, but five months old, I would guess. Unbelievably mature. Um, more mature than his sister, but his sister in the last week or two has just completely changed as well. I, I'm really impressed with her growing up. Um, but either anyway, what I'm get, my point with it is, is two months apart is far enough that you can probably manage one and or the other long enough to get them to the point where they're to an age where, yeah, you can, I, I'm not against, like I take my dogs, I take these dogs for walks together. I've been taking them for walks together from day one. Um, Blue, obviously by himself when he was really little, he couldn't keep, quite keep up with everybody else. As he got a little bit older, he got to pack in with, with some of these dogs. Makina was the same way. I'd take Makina on walks. Um, but what I would do is always have control of the situation. So like with my old dogs, I tell them to heal. They'd heal off lead, but they're in heel position. They're right there. So the little puppy just moves with us. And I actually think it helped the little puppy understand heel. Like these two dogs are healing off lead, both of them, younger than I've ever had dogs healing off lead with confidence. So I think part of it had to do with we took a lot of walks with old dogs in heel position and the dogs just kind of assumed that this is where I need to be. So we shaped the behavior real early and then we made it a little more formal later on by themselves in more of a technical training situation. And so a lot of that stuff you can see on the videos on our YouTube channel or on our training library on our website. Makina's has been posted and being posted right now. Blue's is being saved for kind of a special project that we're doing. But I think that you can use those dogs to, and, uh, that are close in age to your advantage. But it has to be under control. So I don't think it's any different than... Um, any other dog raising any other dog is with the two of them, you probably have to be a little bit more conscious of it because you got two young pups. And so you have to be realistic with what they're capable of doing. But no, I, I don't know that I change much um, as far as my approach. I definitely don't change it in the idea of making it looser. Like, oh, we got two puppies, we can let them play because they're two puppies. No, I don't, I, no, I wouldn't do that. No different than if I've got one puppy, I don't let it just raise all kinds of hell because it's, because it's a puppy. I think structure is real important. And this is the only, the, the thing with the beauty of this for you is you've got a built in distraction there with your brother's dog. Now, yeah, as long as your brother's on the same page with his puppy, if your brother decides my dog can do whatever it wants, whenever it wants to do it, and you're going, I really want to have a good foundation for my dog, and I have aspirations to take it into the field, and I want a well-behaved, well-disciplined dog. If you're in that, on that side of the tracks and your brother's on the other side, I'd make sure that you brought your kennel when you went to family things because your pup's going to probably stay in the kennel. Because I don't think it's, you know, now if it's at your house, again, this is, earlier question that we talked about people and the importance of managing people and understanding how to deal with people more so than puppies. But if it's at your house, I'd say, well, out of respect, your brother should bring his kennel. And if the brother's puppy can't follow the rules at your house, then the, then it, he can't have that puppy there do, raising all kinds of hell because your dog is being trained and you're working on developing certain expectations and behaviors out of your dog. So if you go to mom and dad's house, I'd bring the crate. And I'd let, you know, if I wouldn't be the guy to say, you put your dog away because I'm here, but I'd be ready to have a place or a spot where I can put that dog to keep it out of harm's way when it comes to forming bad habits. So I do think that uh, if you get them on the same page and you're working together, boy, it can be, you can have a huge advantage because not everybody has the chance to socialize their dogs that way. Not everybody has the chance for their dogs to be put in a situation where they have to behave a certain way around other dogs. And if your brother's doing the same thing, Ben and I are in a good spot with those litter mates because his, his puppy goes home at night, comes here during the day. Blue gets to see her as much or as little as we decide. 
And so will we work them together at some point? Yeah. Are we working together now? No, because they're just not, they're not, they're not capable of it, that focus. But I go down to the shop with Blue and we put another dog bed out. Now we got two dogs on beds 10 feet away from each other. And it's, Blue's really good at it because he's used to it. He's got four other dogs here in the house that he has to lay on a bed next to. But Cleo down there doesn't get to see that every day. So it's really advantage Cleo when it comes to opportunity to train around another dog that's used to having another dog around and understand that its behavior doesn't change. So I think you got, I think if you, if you work this situation in your favor, it can be really beneficial. If you allow it to kind of free for all a little bit, it's going to make, it, it could be, a tr- it could be trouble. It can make, make life a lot harder, uh, could create some issues going down the road. So good question, Kevin. I'm going to send you a message, uh, let you know that we talked about it in this podcast. Um, I'm going to cut out. I got to get into onto a phone call right now, but um, thank you guys for listening. If you do me a favor, um, as always, I kind of ask for it at the end. If you, if these, if you find value in these, I just got a message yesterday from, or it was today, I read it from Australia a person that listens to our podcast from Australia and then they start following us on YouTube and they were really, they just, they sent a very nice message and they were thanking me for what we do. And I, I want to thank you guys for following us and, and I appreciate that support and the guys, Ben and Logan and Bryce and those guys that are working to put these things together for us, um, working really hard at it too. So I appreciate them doing what they're doing. If you would do us a favor, whatever you're listening to this, if you're listening to it on a, on any podcast apps, um, Apple, I listen to the Apple one, I think, but um, Ben's got it on multiple different podcast apps. If there is a place for you to leave a review, I'd really appreciate it. I know, I know it takes, takes a couple minutes, um, but if you leave a review, uh, whether it be a ranking and or uh, leaving a comment, it would help us greatly be able to reach more people. And that's our goal. Our, our whole intentions with all the content that we share is to try to help as many people as we can that are training their own dogs. So if you'd be willing to do that, I'd appreciate it. Otherwise, I'll continue recording these. Um, I, pre- I thank you for listening and we'll be back with more.